السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam it's only ever usually a matter of time before the concern with regards to a person's children, progeny, and his or her extension of their legacy begins to bother you and agitate you and give you sleepless nights. Indeed, it is a thought and a worry that is deserving of every single Muslim, wakeful Muslim that is. And in a world that is always changing so rapidly, it is difficult to keep up. In a world whereby your ability to control the exposure that your son or daughter has to has become virtually impossible. In a world whereby you have governmental policies that are putting into place policies in order to influence what your children will see with regards to sex education and genitalia and other images and intimacy and elements of identity in a world that is of this nature, we have every right to be worried and anxious. And indeed, the predominant theme in the world of parenthood today is one of fear and anxiety. However, the influences that I just listed earlier, they are not the most powerful of influences with regards to your children. And this is a short reminder that applies to the Muslim and non-Muslim, and applies to the young and the old, and it applies to male and female, and the practicing and non-practicing as well. Those elements of influences that I listed earlier, they are not the most powerful. Rather, the undisputed champion, the unrivaled champion, when it comes to his or her ability, to influence a child is none other than the father, none other than the mother. They have no competitor, and I agree with you. We live in an era whereby everyone is racing to compete with you as a parent to raise your child on your behalf. The media is competing, the film industry is competing, games are competing, the government is competing. But nobody can be ahead of the mother and father. Rather it wouldn't be excessive or an overstatement to say the following. And these were the statements of Imam Ibn Qayyim rahmatullahi alayhi in his book, Tuhfatul Mawdud. He said, وَأَكْثَرُ الْأَوْلَادِ إِنَّمَا جَاءَ فَسَادُهُمْ مِنْ قِبَلِ الْآبَاءِ He said, the majority of children who grow up to become corrupt people, they are such because of their parents. This is the opinion of Imam Ibn Qayyim. You may agree or disagree. He says, in the majority of cases, it is the direct reason, i.e. the mother or the father. So what is your plan? What is your plan, my brother, for your children? Whether you are married or unmarried, whether you are practicing or unpracticing, this is not just about you. What is your written plan for your children? Because there is an unmissable reality that is unfolding before our very eyes, whether we realize it or not. That reality states that if I, as a conscious Muslim, do not prepare a plan, a written plan, a clearly identifiable plan for my daughter, for my son, then I have definitely handed over my son to the planning of other people. Planning is essential and writing down those goals and how you're going to achieve them is just as essential. There was a fascinating study that took place in the year 1979 on the MBA Harvard graduate program, whereby a group of graduates were interviewed and they asked them the question, do you have any goals with regards to your future? And have you written them down? And do you know how you're going to achieve them as well? 3%, 3%. They said, yes, we have goals, we have objectives, where we want to be with regards to our careers, and we have written them down as well. 13% said, we have goals, but we haven't written them down. And the remaining 84% said, we have no goals and we haven't written anything down either. What was the outcome? They came to the same set of students 10 years later. And what was the findings? Absolutely staggering, subhanAllah al The findings were as follows. 
the 13% who had goals with regards to their future but had not written them down, they were earning twice as much as the 84% who had no goals. Allahu Akbar. And as for the 3% who had goals and they knew how they were going to reach them, and they had written them down, what was the outcome? They were earning 10 times more than 97% of the class combined. What is your plan for your child, dear brother? What is your plan for your child, dear sister? Have you written them down? Here, the question poses itself is, is it an obligation? Can I not just take it as each day comes, ad hoc? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that is not the case. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara wa quuduha an-nasu wal hijara Allah says oh you who believe protect yourselves and your families from a fire the fuel of which is man and stone a'udhu billah Protect yourselves from a fire and your families. Allah says, how do I do that? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the companion, he said, Addibuhum wa'allimuhum by nurturing them to have good manners and by educating them as well. So where do I start? As a 13-year-old man, a 13-year-old woman, a person who has no children, a sister of ours who may be pregnant and is expecting. A father, mother, an uncle of ours who have children who have graduated. What is the plan? Where do I start? And I will suggest a few milestones. These are our guarantors. This is halal Islamic, halal Islamic insurance. Every one of us is obligated to bring out for the welfare of his future, the Islamic welfare of his future of his children's future, not so much the financial one. Number one, beware dear brother, beware dear sister, ya akhi, beware of selfish spouse choosing. A choice whereby it is only taking into consideration your preferences, your likings, your earnings, your, your, your yearnings, your urges, your requirements. Beware of selfish spouse choosing particularly in the era that you are living in and the place that you are occupying as well. Beware of that. And a person who only takes into consideration his or her requirements when choosing that life partner, believe me, this perhaps is a betrayal of your future children because they were not taken into consideration. And much of the decisions that they will go on to make in life are directly linked to the decision that you took for them when choosing their mother, when choosing their father. What fault? What fault was it of theirs? And that is why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, emphasizing this meaning, as the Tirmidhi narrates in his jami' on the authority of Abu Hatimin al-Muzani, he said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ If a man comes to you, requesting the hand of your daughter in marriage, and you are satisfied with regards to his religion, and you are satisfied with regards to his manners, then accept him. Then accept him. Look at the criteria. Religion and manners. And he said the exact same thing with regards to women. He said, as Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of Abi Huraira, he said, Women are usually married on basis of four things. One of four things. He said, Women are usually chosen as wives on the basis of one of four qualities or more, either because of her wealth, either because of her appearance, either because of her lineage, either because of her religious commitment. I, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, I encourage you to take hold of that woman of religion. May you prosper, may you be successful, he said. Allahu Akbar. Now I ask you, ya akhi, I ask you, my sister, in light of that, take a look at the majority of marriages that you may be aware of, whether family, whether friends. Would you say that the majority of them were formed on that basis? Or would you say that maybe more than half were not on that basis, rather, 
they were premarital relationships. That's how they started. Secret conversations and contact. Premarital contact. Allahu musta'an. There were things that were said, things that were done, meetings that took place that should not have happened. And then at some point in their life, they realized the wrongness of what they are doing. And so they wanted to clear up the mess. And so they sealed the deal in the form of marriage. And Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward them whilst we congratulate them that they realized the sinful nature of their relationship in the past. But I ask the question, that type of marriage, did it take into consideration the children? Were they thought about in this entire palava? Or were they cast aside? And it's a cycle, dear brother, dear sister, that happens over and over and over again. Marriage is last on the line. We only marry after everything has happened. And who is the victim? Who is the victim every single time? It's that child who was not considered. That child who was not planned for with regards to his or her Islamic future and who we want the parent to be. The victim is the religion of Islam that continues to wait for the next generation of youth who will raise the banner of deen within the hearts of people and within the land of Allah. This is milestone number one. Ensure that you stay away, dear brother, dear sister, from selfish spouse choosing. Try to look at the bigger picture. This will be the mother. This will be the father of my progeny, the extension to my future when I am six feet under, wedged in the soil. And here I offer you just a very quick footnote if you do not mind. It would not be excessive to say that one of the most knowledgeable creation of Allah Jalla Jalalu, perhaps coming second place only to the prophets and messengers, with regards to the knowledge and the know-how of tarbiyah, the science of nurturing and the mastery of carving greatness from men and women is the mother coming second place as i mentioned perhaps to none other than the prophets and messengers who can be better than her consider with me as zubair ibn al-awwam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu the companion of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam one of the 10 who were promised paradise the very first to unsheathe his sword in the path of islam a young man who embraced Islam in his formative early years, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam, what is he but a seed that was planted by his mother? He was the son of Safiyyah, the daughter of Abdul Muttalib. He was such an accurate reflection of her. Consider with me Abdullah ibn Ja'far, one of the most honorable of the young men of Mecca. One of the most generous of Muslim Arabs, a companion of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the last to see the face of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the tribe of Hashim. What is Abdullah ibn Ja'far? But a seed that was planted by his mother because his father had died. Ja'far, his father had died in the battle of Mu'tah. He was martyred there. Who was the one who carved greatness out of him? It was his mother, Asma bin Umais. He was a reflection of her. Consider with me Amir al Mu'mineen, the leader of the believers, the mastermind of a leader, the scribe of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muawiyah, the son of Abi Sufyan. What is he but a seed that was planted by his mother? And I truly believe that he was more of an accurate reflection of his mother, Utba, Hind bin Utba, than he was of his father, Abu Sufyan. No comparison. And when he was still a baby in the arms of his mother, and they would say to her, in Asha, Muawiyah to Sada Qawmahu, if your son Muawiyah grows to reach the age of maturity, we believe that he's going to lead his entire community. He's going to be the leader of his tribe. What did his mother say? She took that as an insult. She said, Thakiltuhu illam yasud illa qawmah. May he die if he only leads his people. May I lose him if he will only lead his people. And her wish came to fruition and he became the leader of the believers, the Khalifa of Islam. And when he wanted to take pride, when he needed to identify himself, what would he say? An Ibn Hind, I am the son of Hind. I am the son of Hind. I am the son of my mother, Allahu Akbar. Consider with me, Sufyan al-Thawri, rahmatullahi alayhi. What was he but a seed that was planted by his mother? 
His father wasn't around. Sufyan, Amir al Mu'mineen fil Hadith, leader of the believers when it comes to the science of Hadith. What did his mother say to him when he was still a young boy? She would say to him, Ya Bunay, utlub al Hadith wa ana akfika bi maghzili. Oh my son, go and pursue knowledge. Go and learn Hadith. And I will finance you through the weaving that I do. I will finance you. Allah. Consider with me Abdul Rahman al Nasr, who entered into the area of Al Andalus, the Iberian Peninsula, at a time when it was the capital of political turmoil. And he managed by Allah's permission, and then through his jihad, he managed to restore order and peace and security in Al Andalus. And it would also grow to become the capital of civilization and enlightenment and progressive thought and knowledge. And his men would continue marching till they would reach parts of Switzerland and parts of Italy. And they would reach the heart of France as well. What is Abdul Rahman al Nasr? But a seed that was planted by his mother because his father and his uncle were both killed and many members of his family as well. Brothers and sisters, this is really just a quick footnote I wanted to mention with regards to our sisters, my sister, much of our future as an ummah, much of our future as an ummah rests on your shoulders. So I beg you specifically to make the correct decisions in life. We, as men and women, we are at your mercy. So this is milestone number one. Beware, my brother, beware, my sister, of selfish spouse choosing. Milestone number two, what else am I required to do if I am expecting children or I hope to become a father one day? Ensure, my brother, ensure, my sister, that you are a person of deen. Do you worry about your kids? Are you worried about what they're going to see and hear and learn in school? Safety net number two says, you be a person of deen because your religiosity is interwoven with theirs. And that is why when Prophet Musa was traveling with Al-Khadr and they came across a community that was very stingy and they refused to offer them hospitality. When they were leaving, Prophet Musa realized that there was a wall that was leaning. It was about to fall. So Al-Khadr, he made his way to this wall and he made it stand upright. He fixed it for them. Musa said to him, why would you do that? Why would you serve a community that didn't even offer us the basics of hospitality as travelers? What did Al-Khadr say? Here is the lesson. وَأَمَّا الْجِدَارُ فَكَانَ لِغُلَامَيْنِ يَتِيمَيْنِ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ وَكَانَ تَحْتَهُ كَنْزٌ لَهُمَا وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا He says to him that with regards to the wall that I fixed, there was a treasure beneath it that belonged to two orphans who lived in that city and their father was a righteous man. Look at the link. Allah wanted to protect that treasure that belonged to those two orphans. Their father was a righteous man. See how Allah preserves those children through the righteousness of the parent? And that is why Ibn Kathir, he said, commenting on this ayah, he says, فِيهِ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ الرَّجُلَ الصَّالِحَةِ يُحْفَظُ فِي ذُرِّيَّتِهِ وَتَشْمَلُ بَرَكَةُ عِبَادَتِهِ لَهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ This is a clear-cut evidence from the Qur'an, he said, that man will be protected with regards to his children through his own religion, through his own religiosity. And the blessing of your worship will encompass your children as well. Ya salam. And that is why Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he would pray, and when he would finish his prayer, he would say to his son, Inni usalli thumma fiha min ajli Oh my son, I am praying, and sometimes I want to finish early, but then I remember you, my child, and so I make the prayer extra long, hoping Allah will make you righteous through it. So go back, my brother, go back, my sister, reassess your situation, reassess your private communication, reassess how you are presenting yourself in social media. Reassess how you are making money. What are your sources of income? Reassess your secret habits. Reassess what you are inhaling and drinking. Reassess how you enjoy your weekends. What is your understanding of entertainment? Readdress your dress code. Realize that your religion is very much part of the religion of your children now and in the future as well. This is safety net number two. Are you taking note of it? Number three, what is next? Perhaps they are now married. We avoided selfish spouse choosing. 
I have repented to Allah from my sins. I am trying to be a righteous father, a righteous mother. What else am I to do to protect my children? Look, subhanAllah, it doesn't start at the age of puberty and the age of five. and It starts before that. What happens next? Maybe marital relations are about to take place now. This is your wedding night. There is prophetic instruction even here to protect your children. Look at how early it starts. Even on your wedding night, the Sharia is thinking about those children. And that is why Bukhari and Muslim narrate on the authority of Ibn Abbas that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو أن أحدكم إذا أهله لو أن أحدكم إذا أتى أهله فقال بسم الله اللهم جنبنا الشيطان وجنب الشيطان ما رزقتنا فقضي بينهما ولد لم يضره He said if any one of you wishes to approach his spouse in the halal he should say Bismillah in the name of Allah O oh Allah protect us from shaitan keep him away from us and keep shaitan away from what you will give us He said if they are given a child shaitan will not harm him shaitan will not harm her Ya Allah, subhanAllah, brother Ali, I never realized that planning for the child has to start this early. Yes, it starts much earlier than we thought because we want a red carpet entrance for them when they come into this world. A red carpet entrance of Islamic identity and deen, a nest of iman. What next? Maybe now the signs of pregnancy are appearing on our sister. I ask Allah Almighty to bless our mothers, bless our daughters, bless our aunties. Maybe the signs of pregnancy are appearing. What next? The Sharia has something to say. Make this period a period of dua, intense dua. Why? For the Islamic future of the children. Look at the words of the mother of Mary, Maryam alayhi salam. Rabbi inni nadhartu laka ma fi batuni muharraran fataqabbal minni. Oh Allah, I have promised you that whatever is in my womb, it is purely for your service. Have you ever said that, my sister? Have you ever said that or encouraged your daughter, your wife? Your sister to say this dua, whatever is in my womb, this is a waqf, this is an endowment, this is for you and your deen, O oh Allah. Look at the dua of Zakaria, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who would say, Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyibatan innaka sami'u dua. O oh Allah, bless me from you a good offspring. Look at the concern of the prophets. Give me from you a good offspring. You are the one who hears dua. Good in their appearances, good in their choices, good in their Islam, good in their grades in school, good in their graves, good in their hereafter. Memorize this dua. Ibrahim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at his dua. Rabbi ja'alni muqeema salati wa min dhurriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Oh Allah, make me a person who establishes the prayer. And from my offspring is one. Well. Allahu Akbar. How much dua are you making for them now before they even exist? How much dua are you making for them now that they exist? This is milestone number three. What next, Brother Ali? Perhaps now she has been rushed to hospital and there's only now a few moments and the pushing begins and the baby is born and there is happiness. May Allah give her Jannah through that difficult circumstance. What next? The Sharia has something to say to ensure the Islamic future of the children. Maybe the baby hasn't even been washed. Maybe the umbilical cord is yet to be cut. The Sharia has something to say. Give the adhan. Give the adhan in the ear of the child. Subhanallah. As is found in the hadith of at tirmidhi on the authority of Abi Rafi'ah. Give the adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You're saying to the child, this is your Lord. This is your priority in life. He hears, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I testify none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. This, O oh my son, is your manhaj, your methodology in life. This is Tawheed, the oneness of Allah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is your goal. This is your role model. Hayya ala salah. Come to prayer. You are a person of worship. Hayya ala falah. Come to success. This is your understanding of success. Oh my child, worship and succeeding in the hereafter. And then the baby is born. What next? Choosing a name. The Sharia has something to say. Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Give your children the names of the prophets. And the most beloved of names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. And the truthful names are Aharith and Hammam. And the most despised names to Allah are Harb and Murrah, war and bitterness. Because names can affect the influence. The names can influence the personality of a child. 
And so Sharia says, make sure that you give them the best of names. And that's why the Messenger وسلم, would also change those corrupt names and give them good names. A man said to him, my name is Ghawi, astray. He said, your name is Rashid, you are guided. A man said to him, my name is Asi, the sinner. He said, your name is, your name is Jamil, the beautiful one. A woman said to him, my name is Barra, the righteous one. He said, no, your name is Zainab, meaning a beautifully, beautifully scented flower. Look at the optimism of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. The Sharia has something to say in each phase that your child experiences. Why? To ensure that Islam is part of his blood, part of her nerves, part of their flesh, part of their bones. Not just protected from fitna and challenges, but they are visionaries. They are people who are revivalists. They are people who are game changers in the societies that they are living in. Create a plan for your children, dear brothers and sisters in Islam. If you don't know how to do that, consult a parent, a friend, a sheikh, somebody you know who can. What is your 10-year vision for your children? And realize by doing so, you will be securing your own future when you die and you will be securing theirs.